Well, good morning. Man, we've had some incredible worship, haven't we? That was absolutely amazing. You know, there's power in worship, and worship just paves the way for what God's going to do, and it also sends Satan on his tail a-running, and so we're so thankful for that. I want to tell you, first of all, it's so good to be back, and I want you to know that you have been missed. I want to welcome everybody who's watching online, and I want to give a shout-out to some people. I want, I want to give a shout-out to Bill and Shelly, who I know are watching in Ark City. I want to give a shout-out to um, Deb and to Rich, who are watching in um, South Dakota, and I just want to say to you that we're so glad that you've come to worship with us. If you're a guest here this morning, if this is your first or your second or your third time and you're looking for a church home, I hope that when you walked into this room that you felt something different. If you're praying about making this your church home, I want to just tell you that immediately following our services, if you would just go out to the guest services, I'm going to be out in that way. I'd love to meet you. Maybe you have some questions. Maybe you're just looking for some information. But I'm going to ask that you would, would consider and prayerfully consider making this your church home. Because if you ask me, do we want you here? My answer is yes. Yes, we want you here. Okay? All right, before I begin, I also want to take a moment. I want to thank Pastor Justin. Didn't he do a great job? He did an awesome job. Awesome job. All right, now, I want, I want you to help me with something now, okay? Pastor Justin and Pastor Aaron and Pastor David and Pastor Jordan, these are our young pastors that we are grooming at this church. I want you to know, I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for this church. I was an associate here in this church as I learned how to preach, as I learned how to get up on the platform and represent the Lord Jesus Christ. It was central community that helped groom me to help me to become what I am today. Now, I'm asking you to help me do the same thing with these young pastors because I want them to know and I want them to believe that God has big plans for them, right? And we also need to understand that we don't own them. The Lord does. So we don't know what the plans are, but while we're here, we want to pour into them, okay? So here's how I need you to help me. When you see them after they've preached or whatever, the last thing I want you to do is go up to them and say, wow, you are an amazing speaker. Wow, you should be doing this all the time, okay? Now here's why I don't want you to do that, because that addresses the heart of the man, and the Bible tells us that the heart of man is sinful, it's evil, you know what I would rather have you say to them? I would rather have you go up to them and say, I can see how God is working in your life and using him, using you for his purposes. Here's why that's important. The glory and the power then stay where it's supposed to, and that's with him. If you talk to any one of these young guys, and as they come up here, and there's going to be some that are going to get their very first chance, and there's something about standing in front of a thousand people or whatever, you know what? Here's what I want you to do is just remind them, you know what? I can see God working through you, and that's the man, that's the woman that God is going to bless, because God's the only one that deserves our, uh, the glory. Amen? Amen? All right, now. We're starting a new series today, and the series is called The Armor of God. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, more of you. you you've heard about it, right? But if I think that there's two things that we need to be talking about in the church right now more than anything else, number one is spiritual warfare, and the second thing is the end times, because we're getting close. In this series, I hope maybe that you're going to hear something different or learn something different. But what I want to do is I want to, through God's Word, I'm not going to teach you. God's Word, through the Holy Spirit, is going to teach you how you can use this armor in your lives. Because the problem that we're going to find out is that we have the army, but very few people use it. How do you know, Pastor Bob? That's why we have our hospitals and our drug addictions and alcohol and all of these things are going on because they're not using the armor that God has given to us. So, let's begin. My favorite invention is the DVR. You know why? Because it's football season. Woo! Okay? All right, now. 
great group here. All right, so here's why. You know what? I love football. This, this is one of my favorite times of the year. But I also know that during this time, ministry still goes on. And a lot of times it happens on Saturdays and Sundays, and that just happens to be the days that the football games are on. So I'm thankful to the Lord for the DVR, because you know why? Because I can record my game, and then I can go home, and I can watch it in its entirety. There's one catch. Whenever I go out and I do ministry, and people start talking about football, la 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 la, don't tell me what the score is. Now, I wish that always happened, but it never happens. Somebody always tells me, or I hear it on the radio or something like that, and I go home and I end up watching the game. But I want you to know something. I still watch the whole game. Now, last year, I remember there was a particular game, and I had a wedding here, and I came and did the wedding, and I didn't want anybody to tell me what the score was. And wouldn't you know it, I just happened to walk by a couple, and they were talking about the game, and I heard the score, and I heard that my team had won. All right, now, here's what I want you to know. I still went home and I watched the entire game. But I watched it differently. You know why? Because I had this pre-knowledge. I already knew what the outcome was. So here's what happened. When my team fumbled the ball, and they fumbled the ball a couple times, if you were upstairs, you would hear me say, put some stick em on your fingers, boy! And when they threw an interception, and they threw several of them, it's the jerseys are red. The jerseys are red. You know what I'm talking about, right? But I got to tell you something, though. Even in the midst of all those mistakes, it wasn't that they weren't a big deal. I just knew the outcome, and so they didn't bother me quite as much. You see, that special knowledge that I had enabled me to look at the game different because I knew in the end my team won. That's what Paul is trying to tell us in this series. He's telling us that in life, you have to look at life different. When it comes to the mistakes, when it comes to all of the things that happen, you can't look at life the same way the world does. Why? Because in the end, for the believer, we win. I know where I'm going to spend eternity. So, the way I view the stuff that goes on in the world is different because I have a pre-knowledge of what already happened. Case in point, this last week, do we value them both? I never saw that coming, but I know what happened. The church didn't show up. It's real simple. When they went and they did all of their statistics and things, if everybody showed up, they were confident we were going to win. But you know what? We didn't. Okay? Now, is that important? Sure it is important. But I also am not going to let it bug me. I'm not going to let it throw me off my game. Why? Because I know the end of the story. All right. For this message today, I need to get ready, so I need to change my shoes, okay? Okay? Somebody said to me in first service, you look like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> All right, now, I want to tell you why I'm changing my shoes. I'm changing my shoes because these have leather soles. And you know what? On this carpet, these leather soles tend to slip and slide. And I want you to understand, I've got rubber soles with me because I'm interested in sure-footedness, okay? I want to make sure I don't slip, Isn't the truth the same in athletics? I mean, you think about it. A golfer wears special shoes, don't they? Right? What do they do? They have cleats on them. Why? So that they don't slip and fall. A football player wears special shoes, doesn't he? I mean, if it's on AstroTurf, if it's on a, a synthetic surface, he'll wear something rubber like this. But if he's playing on natural grass, what's he going to do? He's going to put on spikes, right? Same thing for a baseball player. Baseball players wear cleats. Why do they do that? They wear these cleats. They wear these kinds of shoes so that they don't slip and fall. Their whole interest is having sure-footedness. All right, now, I want to ask you a question here. Why is sure-footedness so important? Here's why. It's the key to victory. 
Tell me something. If you're playing basketball or you're playing some type of sport, or maybe even your job, maybe you're a fireman or maybe you're a police officer, are you going to be successful if you're slipping and sliding around? Of course not. You're going to lose. And that's the point I want to make this morning. I've got these shoes on so that I can be sure-footed and I can make sure that I don't slip and slide. Why? Because I don't want to lose. I don't want to fall. That's what the Apostle Paul is telling us. As he starts out this book of Ephesians, this is what he says, not once, not twice, but three different times. He says, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. What does he mean? He means this, don't move, don't move, don't move. Did you know that a quarterback, before he throws the football, the key to a successful throw is found not in his hands, not in his arm, it's in his feet. That footwork is critical. The same thing for a fireman. Can you imagine a fireman trying to climb a ladder with slippery boots on? It's not going to work. And so the Apostle Paul tells us this. He says, we're in a spiritual battle. And in order for you to be, be victorious, the first thing you need to understand is you've got to be able to stand firm. You can't slip and fall. You have to stand firm. Now, what does that mean? Here's what Paul is saying. Don't get all up in arms about all of the things that you're happening, that you see happening in the world. Don't get all up in arms about the political things. Don't get involved in all of the disasters that are happening in the world. Stand firm because you're in a battle. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're in a battle whether you like it or not. And Paul is saying to us, I want you to be successful. I want you to be victorious. Now, I also want you to understand something when Paul tells us to stand firm. It's also the same word that is used in the Old Testament, and the word in the Old Testament is courageous. You see, what Paul is telling us is the same thing that the Lord told Joshua, be strong and courageous. What's he telling us? Here's what it is. Men, we're in a battle. And the battle is for your family. The battle's for your marriage. Satan wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your family. He's coming after your kids. And this is a call to arms. And Paul is telling us we better stand firm because the devil is coming. And what we're going to do over the next several weeks is we're going to learn about the equipment that God has given us so that we not only can stand firm and just survive, but so we can thrive and be victorious. That's what we want, right? And I want to suggest to you, these tools, this equipment that God has given to us is all that you need. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it, but if you use this equipment, you will be successful. Stand with me out of respect for God's Word. As I read from Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 10 through 18. Here we go. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasion with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert 
always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. This is God's word. This is God's battle plan. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I've read the book, and I know how this whole thing called life ends. We win. But in the meantime, the battle rages on. Teach me how I'm supposed to fight so that I might not be disqualified. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So Paul is in prison right now. This book in the Bible called Ephesians is called a prison epistle, which just simply means it's a prison letter. Paul is in prison in Rome, and he's surrounded. He's got Roman guards around him, and he writes this letter to the church at Ephesus, and it's a great letter. He's not getting on them or reprimanding them for every, anything. What he's doing is he's encouraging them because the church at Ephesus was kind of the happening church. It's the church that if you were in Ephesus, that's the church you would go to. Now, we know a lot about this church. If you want to read more about this church, it starts in Acts chapter 19, and you can read the whole story about what happened. But I want to give you a little bit of a, of a picture of what happened. Paul was to visit the, the city of Ephesus on his second missionary journey. And when he gets there, he goes to the synagogue, okay? Now, I want to stop right there for just a minute. I wonder where he got that idea. Where did Paul get the idea of going to the synagogue? Well, you know what? If you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, you know what you're going to find about Jesus? The Bible says every time he went into the city, he went to the synagogue. Why? As was his habit. So here's the Apostle Paul. What's he doing? He's just following the example. I'm going to be like Jesus. And that's exactly what he did. So he goes to the church of Ephesus, and you know what? Guess what happens? Ministry happens. Things start growing. The gospel of Jesus Christ is preached. You see, their problem was is they knew about John's baptism, but they hadn't heard about the baptism of Jesus. And Paul begins to fill them in and tell them that Jesus is who he says he is. He was the, he's the Messiah. He's the one that died for our sins. And listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't just come from the Jews. He came for all the Gentiles. Woohoo! They had to be whipping and hollering. And the Bible says that God gave him great success there. And then you know what happened? Oh, a group of Jews, unbelieving Jews from the previous city, heard that he was in Ephesus, and they came in, and they just caused a mess. And Paul's life was in danger. So what did Paul do? He left the synagogue, and he went to a place called the School of Tyrannus. And you know what he did there? He just kind of set up shop in all of Asia. The Bible says hey, people from all over Asia started coming in and asking Paul questions. And guess what happened? Ministry grew. The church grew. People got, got saved. More and more people became followers of Jesus Christ or the way as it was known right there. And everything was good. But my friends, you know what? Paul had a special power from the Lord. You know what he was able to do? He was able to heal people. In fact, his power was so great, the Bible tells us that people would bring their handkerchiefs and they would rub their handkerchiefs against him. And then they would take these handkerchiefs home and they would place them over their loved ones or those who were sick and people would be healed from it. But not only that, he also called out demons. He exercised demons out of people. <coughs> Excuse me. It's kind of funny because there was a time there was a group of men called the Sons of Sceva. And what they were doing is they'd been kind of following Paul around, and they were just amazed by the power that he had. And so you know what they did? They started listening to what he was doing and watching what he's doing, and then they decided to try it themselves. So one day they're out and about, and they get to come up to this guy who's demon-possessed, and here's what they say. They follow Paul's word. In the name of Jesus and the, the Paul preaches, come out. And you know what? The demons came out. But this is what happened next. The demons looked at these men and they said, Jesus Christ we know and Paul we know, but who are you? They then went back into the man and they pounded the daylights out of, this guy, out of these guys and they ran away bleeding and naked. Now here's what I want you to think about this. The power of the gospel was so strong that people were being convicted and in those days and in those places, there was a lot of witchcraft and things going on to the god of Artemis. And what happened is people started bringing all of their books of incantation. 
and they would place them in the city square and they burned them. The Bible says literally millions of dollars went up in smoke, all because of what Paul was doing. Well, you knew as soon as this started happening, something was going to happen bad. And a man by the name of Demetrius, the Bible tells us that he was a silversmith, and his job was to make idols. And he kind of was the black market, and he had many people who were involved with him. And this is how they made their money. They made little idols to Artemis. But Paul was preaching that these idols are not gods. There's only one God, and their business was in the tank. So you know what they did? They got a large group of people, and they came into the city square, and they called such a ruckus that Paul and his followers had to leave because their lives were threatened. All right, now, with the knowledge of all of that, I want you to listen to what Paul talks about when he thinks about this ministry. Look at what he says here. But I will say, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door of effective work has been opened to me and there are many who oppose me. Can you imagine that? You've got lying Jews that are telling stories about Paul. You've got fake exorcists that are trying to cast out demons and you have the black market all against you and Paul says an open door has been given to me. Now, here's what I want you to understand about this spiritual battle that I believe that Paul wants us to know. Listen very carefully. When you bear much fruit, there will be persecution you must endure. I'm going to say that again. When you bear fruit, there's persecution that you're going to have to endure. Now, I'm going to say this to you in love, but you need to know this. You think that the persecution is all going to come from the world. The Bible says, no, a lot of it's going to come from within. (gasps) Within the church? That's right. And the passage of Scripture that he uses about that is the parable of the wheat and the tares. You remember The Lord tells this parable, and there's all this weeds growing, but then there's tares. Somebody comes in and plants weeds, and you know what? All the weeds start growing with it, and the servants say, let's go out and let's burn. Let's get rid of all of the weeds, and Jesus says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, because you may get some of the wheat. I'm not going to lose a single one of mine, but then he says, the day of judgment is coming, and on that day, that's when the Lord will decipher who is for him and who is against him. Paul tells us, church Get ready, because as we do bear fruit for the Lord, the persecution is coming. All right, now, when I was little, we used to have church picnics. And I can remember when we would go to this church picnic, um, they had this thing called the fish pond. And what would happen is that it was for little kids, and we would go, and basically, I know you're going to really laugh at this, but they gave us cane poles. How many of you know what a cane pole is? (laughs) Thank you. I'm not the only one. So these cane poles would have a string, and on the end of the string, they would have a clothespin. And here's what they would tell you. If you throw your, if you throw your pole, if you throw your bait into the, the fish pond, the fish will put a prize on it. So here we are, these little kids, and we're throwing that thing over there, and we'd pull it, they'd yank on it, and then we'd pull it back, and we'd have these prizes. It was the coolest thing. But then I remember one time when a little boy grabbed the curtain and just started running with it, and all of a sudden we saw all these people, these tables with all of these prizes, and we found out, ah, it wasn't really the fish that was giving us the prizes. I was just thinking about today, there's something I think we can learn from this, and here's what it is. There's always something you cannot see controlling what you can. I just want that to sink in a little bit. In life, there is always something that you cannot see controlling something that you can. Take a look at this scripture verse because Paul talks about this. Look at what he says. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of, the, of evil in the heavenly realms. So here's my question for you this morning. What is, talk, what is Paul talking about when he talks about the heavenly realms? What does that mean? This is Paul's spiritual language. This is his secret language as he's describing the invisible world. 
He's describing the heavenly places. He's talking about this is that invisible world that runs parallel with the visible world. All right, now I want to just remind you again, there is the visible world that we all see, right? We live in this world, but there's also the invisible world. And I want you to know that all through this book of Ephesus, Paul talks about this. And here's what he says about the heavenly places. Here's what he says. First thing is this, our blessings are there. He says, Jesus Christ himself is seated there. Later on, he goes on, he tells us, you and I are seated with Christ as believers there. He goes on a little bit further later on, he tells us the angels operate there. And the last thing he tells us in chapter 6 is this, brace yourself, the demons operate from there. Now, what is Paul telling us here? Here's what he's telling us. He's explaining to us that before you see something in the physical, visible world, it's already been predetermined in the invisible, spiritual world. So in other words, before you see with your physical eyes, what's going on in this world, there was a decision that was made beforehand in the invisible world. So here's what that means, you guys. You got to live in two places at the same time. And you may think that's impossible, but it's not, isn't it? Technology has proved that, hasn't it? I can sit in my office right here in Wichita, Kansas, and I can be on a Zoom call at a board meeting in Lake Wales, Florida, right? You see, that's what Paul's trying to tell us here. He's saying this. He's saying, you all live in this world, but as believers, you have to operate from the kingdom of heaven. Everybody crystal clear on that? We here physically But our mind, I get all my directions from my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is in the invisible world. My friends, that's why prayer is so important. Because prayer impacts that invisible world. And I know there's probably many times when you've been praying about something, or probably like most of us, me included, a lot of times I just stop praying because you know what? I don't think it matters. It matters because there are blessings in the invisible world that we don't have simply because we have not asked. Now, I want you to remember something. The Lord Jesus Christ is over everything, right? He's sovereign, right? He's over every business. He's over every government. He's over everything, okay? But he's given himself to the church. In other words, what that means is that All of the people who are living in the world who are not believers, they don't know that God is sovereign and that they are under his authority. But as believers, we know that. That's why we pray to him, because that's where our spiritual power comes from. It comes from what's going on in the invisible world. All right, now, Paul talks to us about, excuse me a second, I need to get, get a drink. My voice just isn't used to doing this anymore. All right, now, so Paul is talking about the weapons. He's talking about the equipment that we need to have and to be successful. And one of the things that I want you to know is this. When you use these weapons, these weapons help you to operate in the spiritual world, which will in turn give you authority over everything that's going on here. Everybody understand that? That's why these tools are so important. If you use these tools, I promise you, it will give you what you need to operate in the invisible world so we can have authority over what's down here on this earth. All right, now, there's a problem, though, that Paul tells us in this, and here's what he tells us. He said, the problem is why most of these tools don't work, this equipment doesn't work, is because y'all don't use it. 
That's why he says, he says not once, not twice, but he says six or seven times, he says, put on the full armor of God. You gotta put it on. He says too many people are trying to fight this spiritual battle on their own, and they just get, they get, they just get ripped apart. And where's the equipment? It's laying on the side. You see, this spiritual equipment isn't something you just put on one time. You put it on every day. Every day. You don't get dressed and say, okay, I'm dressed for life. I hope not. Right? But what do we do? Every day we put on new clothes. And that's what Paul is telling us. He says, every day you have to put on this armor of God. It's critical. All right, one more thing real quick. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. All right, I want you to look at that for a second, okay? What does it mean when he says the day of evil? Man, I wanted to know, what does he mean when he says the day of evil? Well, I understand, you know what, we're in this war, but what Paul's talking about is not a war. He's talking about a battle, isn't he? So what does Paul mean when he says, when the day of evil comes? Here's what it means. It means when you're in the doctor's office and the doctor sits down with you and he tells you you have a disease that cannot be treated. It means when your wife walks into your room and she says, I don't love you anymore. It means when you've been in ministry and you believe that you've been faithful, but people are spreading lies about you. It means when you go to your your financial possession and you think you've got everything you need to retire and you didn't know what happened to the stock market and all of a sudden you've lost everything. When Paul talks about when the day of evil comes to your life, this is what it means, my dear friends. It means when Satan has put his eye on you and his sights now are to destroy you. There's a target on your back and Satan hates the Jesus in you and now he has launched an all-out attack on you and Paul is telling us you can be successful. You can thrive in situations like that. But if you don't put on the full armor of God, you're sunk. All right, now I'm going to wind this down, okay? Because my voice is going quick. Somebody in here is praying that I would go, that it would go fast, so I'm going to make sure that we do, okay? When Paul tells us about this equipment, this armor, he doesn't just tell us about the armor, but listen very carefully. He tells us about the order that it has to be put on. There's a right and a wrong way to put this on. And he tells us it matters in the way that you put this on. And here's what he says about it. He says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. So the very first piece of equipment he gives us is the belt of truth. Huh. What is truth? I'm going to give you a real simple definition, okay? This is what truth is. It's God's view on any subject. That's what it is. Not your view. His view. Now, the question that I hope you also ask is, so why did God pick truth first? Here's the answer. Because truth is the only thing that will dispel the lies of the devil. Remember, your enemy is not flesh and blood. Your enemy is the evil one, and he is a liar. That's all he can do. All he can do is lie. Truth has always been. Truth has always existed. How do you know? Because the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus has always been here. You cannot have a lie unless you have truth. And what you need to know is the lie always makes you know that there is truth. Whoopi Goldberg. You know what Whoopi Goldberg said this last week? She said that God is for abortion. That's what she said. And then she gave a scripture verse to back it up. Want to know what it is? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And here's what she said. This is what she said. She said, you see, you can't force your opinions on me, and I won't force my opinions on you. 
All right, now let me just share with you the lie that they believe. When it comes to this whole abortion thing, there's several lies that they believe, but here's the lie that they believe. They believe that their body belongs to them. That's not truth. Now here's the thing that I want to just say real quickly about truth and then I'm gonna wrap this up. Here's what I mean. It's not the truth that will set you free. It's the truth that you have that will set you free. I know many, many people who have believed that what they've believed is the truth. But the problem is, is they didn't consult the word of God. So r- truth is, the reality is, is how God sees anything, any subject. But that's where we need to look first. Now let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, let's go back to the garden. And all I want to show you here is two things that Satan tells us right from the beginning, because here's what I want you to know. Satan always gives his disguise away. Always. And he does it twice in this verse. Okay? Here's what it says. Now the serpent was more crafty than the other wild animals of the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Okay? What's Satan attacking? He's attacking truth, right? Because truth is God's word. That's what he's attacking. He's attacking truth. How did he do it? He knew Eve didn't know the word of God. And that's when he went after her. And he said, did God really say? He's questioning truth. But here's the thing that I want you to see in that. That's not the biggest giveaway. You know what the biggest giveaway? It's this. Look. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. The, say it together. A little louder. Now let's go to the next part. He said to the woman, did what? Is there something missing there? Where's Lord? If you go to the scriptures all through Genesis up to that point, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord Elohim, sovereign, the one who is over all things, what Satan was saying to Eve is, let's talk about religion. Let's talk about God, the position. But I am not talking about the fact that he is sovereign and that I am under him. No way. You see, Satan always lies, and he always gives his attack away if you just listen, but first, you must know the Word of God. All right, now I want to close with something that I think is really cool, okay? I didn't put this in your notes, but it's, uh, it's the power in the truth of the Word of God, and I'm in Amos chapter 9. You don't have to look at it right now. I'm going to read part of it, but I want you to write down Amos chapter 9, Verses 11 through 15, okay? Listen very carefully. This is a prophecy. Now, in the days, about 2,000 years ago, when they would go to church, when they would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, here's what they would do. They would read the Torah, and then they would have a word from the prophets, and it's called the half Torah. That's what they would do. Amos was one of those prophets. Here's what they read on that particular day. In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be. He's talking about Israel here. So that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I will bring my people, Israel, back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them. The prophecy here is that God is going to bring back the land of Israel, and he will establish that land. That happened on May 15th, 1948, when the boundaries of Israel were once again restored, and Israel became a nation, 
And the Bible tells us never again, never again will they be uprooted. That's the prophecy and the power of the truth of our God. And by the way, May 15th, 1948, you know what day that was? A Sabbath day. (laughs) I love how God just puts a cherry on top just to make sure that we know he's in control. All right, so this is the direction that we're going. Next, we're going to talk about truth and we're going to talk about righteousness, about how we do this. We want something that we had no. This is how we put truth and righteousness in our lives. But it begins by understanding what truth is. All right, now, listen very carefully. There may be some of you here today, you have some questions. And you're just not sure about everything that I've been talking about. There may be some of you here today that says, you know what, I need to know more about this God. I need to know more about his power. Just like those people in Ephesus, you're telling me that Jesus Christ came and died for me? You know what, we have the answers to those questions. And right afterwards, if you would just go out to the starting point, there's some people there waiting for you. They're gonna answer your questions and they're gonna give you some things that will help you to begin this journey. Don't miss the opportunity. Would you please stand? Heavenly Father, can I just say thank you for the truth of your word? Can I just say thankful that in the midst of this nation where everybody thinks that truth is whatever you want it to be, thank you, Father, that truth is a person, that there is truth, and its truth is what you say it is. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to recognize the lies that Satan is spilling into our lives, the lies that are causing us to look to the world to give us the strength and the happiness that we're looking for. I pray, Lord God, that we would be reminded that you have given us everything we need. All we have to do is put on this armor of God, and it begins by putting on truth. And Father, that's the direction we're going. Reveal to us the truth, not what we think it is, but what the Bible says it is. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Receive the benediction as you go, okay? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and go upon you and give you his peace, his joy, and his strength. God bless you. We'll see you next week.